Okay, so welcome everyone to our next IFT seminar. We are happy to have today to Tivoko uh, Kurachet, who is a new postdoc that's starting at the IFT. And he, he studied the PhD uh, in L'Ecole Polytechnique, and he just started uh, last fall here in the Stationary Group. So let me take this as an opportunity to welcome Tivo to the community, to the IFT. Um, I hope we will all enjoy to get to know him a little better and know about his research. So whenever you are ready, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. So hello everyone. Uh, <clears throat> I'm happy to give this talk to introduce myself today. So the title of my presentation is Supersymmetry Breaking and One Loop Consequences. Uh, so because it is uh, the purpose of this talk is to introduce myself to the group, I will uh, begin by very briefly uh, say a few words about me. So I'm a French guy. Uh, I studied my master of physics in Lyon in France and my PhD in Paris, like Irene just told you. Uh, I was at the CPHD and I was supervised by Hervé Partouche. And I joined the IFT for my first postdoc after the thesis in November 2021. So yeah, the purpose of this talk is to introduce myself. So I will not uh, focus on only one topic and go deep into it, but I will rather uh, give you an overview of everything I've done during my PhD. So my main interest was about uh, supersymmetry breaking. So this is a very, very broad topic. So we have investigated uh, three lines of research in this very broad topic. The first one is the concerns the very construction of breaking mechanisms. So the investigation of new realizations of supersymmetry breaking, new realizations and new patterns of supersymmetry breaking. Then uh, given a model where uh, the, super, the supersymmetry is broken, uh, typically uh, there is a potential which is generated at one loop. So this can be a great thing to give a mass to some moduli and to stabilize them. But this one loop potential can also introduce instabilities like tadpoles or tachyons. So the second line of research was to investigate this phenomenon in concrete setups to compute the one loop potential and evaluate the masses acquired at one loop by moduli to precisely to, to be able to say under which conditions instabilities are introduced or not. And finally, the third axis of research uh, consisted in studying the back reaction of the one loop potential on the cosmology. So the, the outline of my talk will follow the, these three points I just mentioned. I will first describe a new supersymmetry breaking mechanism in orientable models. Then uh, we will work in a type one or before model and we will precisely say what I just we will do precisely what I just said, meaning evaluate the masses acquired at one loop by moduli in the model to check under which condition we introduce instabilities or not. Uh, then we will work in an heterotic string framework and analyze the back reaction of the one loop potential to the classical cosmological evolution of the model. And I will and by giving a brief conclusions. Okay, so let's begin with the first part, the first project, and the, de the description of a new supersymmetry breaking mechanism. Before I go into the description of the mechanism, I will review some of existing, existing and known uh, realization of supersymmetry breaking. The first one I will describe, and that will be very important for the rest of this talk, is called the Shark Schwartz mechanism. So this mechanism is not stringy in nature. It can already be implemented at the level of the field theory. And it goes as follows. So suppose you have a space time, which is Minkowski uh, times a compactified circle of radius r. Well, the basic thing to do when you go around the circle is to identify a field with itself. <clears throat> but actually you can do something more general by using a symmetry of your theory. If you write it like e to the i pi q, where q is some charge, well, when you go around the circle, you can identify the field not with itself, but with some kind of rotation using, using this symmetry. 
the consequence of this more general periodicity condition is that when you Fourier transform that to obtain your Kaluzak line modes, well, there is a shift in the Kaluzak line momentum number, which depends on this uh, charge Q. So the simplest way to use this phenomenon to implement supersymmetry breaking is to choose Q to be the space-time fermion number that I write F. <clears throat> so as a consequence, if you do that, uh, for the boson, nothing changes. It is the usual Kaluzak line uh, decomposition, but fermions acquire a shift in the Kaluzak line momentum number and thus a mass. And the breaking scale is given by the inverse of the radius, which is used to implement the mechanism. Now to implement that in string theory, the easiest thing to do is to consider a freely acting orbifold on the circle and to couple it with the non-supersymmetric generator minus one to the F. All right, then another important supersymmetry breaking uh, pattern that has been extensively studied is called brain supersymmetry breaking. <clears throat> um, these models are characterized by a class sector that is uh, strictly supersymmetric and a supersymmetry breaking, which is only visible in the Mobius strip amplitude. These models typically contain non-mutual EBPS uh, objects, the brains and the planes. And let me comment here on the, the conventions I use for the charges and tensions of the various orientifold planes because it can vary a bit in the literature. So for me, <clears throat> the O minus planes have negative tension and negative charge. The O plus planes have positive tension and positive charge. And the entire orientifold have uh, opposite charge compared to the Orientifold. Okay, so a key difficulty in the brain supersymmetry breaking mechanisms in the models where this is implemented is that uh, the global charge of all the objects is uh, zero. So there is no Raman Raman tadpole, but the global tension is not. And this signals the presence of Neve Schwartz Neve Schwartz tadpole. So contrary to the Raman Raman tadpoles, these are not linked to anomalies but they are tadpoles in the usual sense, meaning that the point in field space where you are is not a good vacuum around which um, perform perturbation theory. So this is what motivated our construction to try to describe a mechanism which shares uh, properties of the brain supersymmetry breaking, but while avoiding the Neverschwartz Neverschwartz tadpoles. But the idea of the mechanism is the following. Suppose you start from a supersymmetric model, which contains at the same time O minus and O plus planes, so the two kinds of orientifold planes. And suppose you can consistently replace a pair of O minus O plus plane by a pair of O minus bar O plus bar pair. If you do that, uh, because the global tension and charge of both pairs is zero, you do not introduce any tadpoles so if your supersymmetric model was consistent without that pose, then you do not introduce any. And the simultaneous presence of orientifold planes and anti-orientifold planes uh, will break supersymmetry. A key ingredient in the construction of, this, uh, of all these models is to use a powerful tool which links the, the geometry of the model and the one loop amplitude. So I will describe a bit this link. So you have your one loop amplitudes, the Klein bottle, the annulus, the Mobius strip, up to a nest transformation or something a bit more uh, convoluted for the Mobius strip. This defines what we call the clustering channel amplitudes, which are denoted with tildes. And the geometrical interpretation of this uh, clustering channel amplitude is the following. They describe the propagation of clustering states between uh, the objects of the series, so between D-brains and O-planes. More precisely, the clustering channel Klein button describes the propagation of clustering state between two orientifold planes. The clustering annulus describes the propagation of clustering states between two D brains. And the, trans the clustering channel Mobius strip describes the propagation between an orientifold plane on one side and a, a D brain on the other. So, what this means is that if in your model you know precisely what objects you have, what kind of D brains, what kind of O planes, and if you know where they are located, then you can uniquely deduce the clustering channel amplitudes and thus up to an S transformation, deduce the one loop amplitude, and then 
uncover things about uh, the spectrum of your model, the gauge groups, and so on. So this is quite powerful. Okay, so let's start with the standard SO32 oriented fold projection of the type 2B theory. We will work in eight dimensions. So we compactify it on two circles with radii R8 and R9. So in this model, there are D9 brains and a space typhoon on I minus plane. If we perform a T duality on the two circles, this converts into D7 brains and O7 minus plane. So you all know that in the T dual theory, the oriented fold projection picks up um, a parity along the T dual directions. And by definition, the oriented fold planes are the fixed points of the oriented fold. So this new oriented fold projection omega prime fixes the origin. And combined with the periodicity along the two circles, we see that there are four O7 minus planes which are located at the origin and halfway along each circle. If you compute the total tension and charge of these oriented fold planes, you find 32, meaning that to cancel the tadpole, you need the open string sector and the addition of 32 uh, D7 brains. <clears throat> okay, so let's see how the link between the amplitude and the geometry works in this simple setup. So we will consider the case of the closed string channel klein bottle amplitude. So you remember it describes the propagation of closed string states between two identical planes. So let's suppose we call these oriental planes A and B, and we say they are at some position. We define this little x, xA and xB, which are the position normalized by the radii of the circles. And the closed string state, which is propagating between the oriental planes is labeled by some, some index A and uh, some Kaluza-Klein momentum numbers along the two circles. Then there is the propagator and the couplings to the two O-planes, the O-planes A on the, and the O-planes B. And the propagator has the following form. In the end, what you obtain is a formula like this. And what's important to see in this formula is that the kaluza klein wave functions are multiplied by some phases, which depend on the location of the O-planes. In our case, the oriented four planes are located at the origin and halfway along each circle. So actually these phases are simply uh, signs. They are simply one, minus one to the M8, minus one to the M9, minus one to the M8 plus M9. <clears throat> and then the only thing which is unknown is the expressions are the coupling C. So <clears throat> these couplings depend on what clustering states runs into the propagates into between the two planes. When it's a Raman Raman field, the couplings are given by the charges of the planes. And when it's a never trust, never trust one, and they are given by the tension. Okay, so we can draw again our geometry. We can write the phases, the signs associated to each oriental planes. And we know how to build the Cross twin channel Klein bottle amplitude. You just have to consider the, the whole 16 pairings of oriented four planes, multiply each phases, each signs which correspond, and put the correct sign which corresponds to the tensions times tensions or charge times charge, which in this case will always be plus one. You add all these terms, and then you find that there is some projector on the momentum numbers in your clustering channel amplitude. These are the kaluza clan lattices. And of course, we are in a supersymmetric model. So this is multiplied by V8 minus S8, where they are the characters vectorial and spin order. OK, then for the annulus, uh, so this is the, the clustering channel annulus. Remember, describe the propagation of clustering state between 2D brains. So if we suppose that we put all the brains into a single stack, well, then there will be no projection in the, in the amplitude. And this will come with a multiplicity, multiplicity n square, where n is the number of brains. <clears throat> the Mobius strip describes propagation of clustering state between D brains and oriented fold planes. So it depends on where we put the D brains. Suppose we put them on, in the origin. There will be four contributions. This time there will come with a minus sign because this is 
positive charge and tension of the d brains times negative charge and tension of the O7 planes, seven minus planes. And because there are n brains, this would come with a multiplicity n. So we saw in this simple ex example that just by knowing the geometry of our model, what kind of object we have, where they are, we deduced the closed string channel amplitude. So with that, we can deduce the one loop amplitude and <coughs> uncover features of the spectrum of the theory. In this case, if you write the annulus amplitude plus the Mobius amplitude, and we look at the zero mode, we recognize here the dimension of the I joint representation of a special orthogonal group. So we see that the gauge group is SO32. Okay, let's move on. Uh, in this standard orientifold projection, we just throw out the antisymmetric tensor B, which is killed by the orientifold projection, but actually it is possible to keep no, a non-zero uh, tensor B if it, if it has a quantized value. When you do that, the effect on the geometry it is to change the O7 minus plane at the origin by an O7 plus plane. Now, with this new geometry, if you compute the tension and charge, you find only 16. So you just need to add 16 D7 brains. This means that in this uh, theory, in this model, the rank of the gauge group is divided by two. Now you can play the same game and same game and find the, the clustering channel amplitudes, then deduce the one loop amplitudes. And in the end, what you find is that when you put the brains on top of the O7 plus planes, now you recognize the dimension here of the adjoint representation of a unitary symplectic group. So the gauge group is USP16. Whereas if you put the brains on top of an O7 minus plane, you find a special orthogonal group, SO16 this time. So this model is the starting point of our mechanism because you see that it both contains O7, one O7 plus plane and some O7 minus planes. So what we want to do is now to change the O7 plus into an O7 plus bar and the O7 minus this one here into an O7 minus bar. Once again, you can play the same game, compute the clustering channel amplitudes and so on. What you find is that Surprisingly, the klein bottle amplitudes remained uh, identical to the supersymmetric one. So this is not obvious at all because all the signs of all the, the phases are, are changed, but in the end, everything cancels and you find back the same klein bottle as before. Of course, the annulus amplitude is the same because it only sees the D-brains and not the orientifold plane. So no change on this side. And in the end, the breaking of supersymmetry is only visible in the Mobius strip amplitude, which is reminiscent of brain supersymmetry work. Now looking at the, ah, okay, before, uh, so where we put the brain, actually, we expect that there is only one, uh, one way to, to place the brain without introducing instabilities regarding the brain positions, because we expect the brain to be repelled by the O7 minus bar and attracted by the O7 plus bar so that the only stable position for them is at the origin here. And this can be confirmed by looking at the amplitudes written for arbitrary position and see uh, that the only stable position is here. But when we put the brains here, what we find is again a unitary symplectic gauge group, USP16. And now crucially, there is a uh, so supersymmetry is broken. We can see that we don't have uh, V8 minus S8 anymore, as expected. And there is a gauge singlet Goldstino, which is uh, an imprint of a nonlinear realization of supersymmetry, which is again reminiscent of brain supersymmetry breaking. So this construction shares a lot of properties of brain supersymmetry breaking models, but without any uh, tadpoles, neither Ramon Ramon, of course no, never Schwartz, never Schwartz. And also without brain instabilities, because if we place them at the origin, um, this is stable. Okay, so we saw that the klein bottle amplitude is uh, the same as the supersymmetric one, but does it mean that the closed trick spectrum is supersymmetric? Actually, a similar construction has been made some years ago but without the understanding of the microscopic ingredient, without the understanding of the geometry, 
And there, the authors thought that yes, it was the, the, the supersymmetric sector was the sorry, the closed sector was supersymmetric. Actually, we argue that this cannot be the case. And we can again understand that with geometry arguments. Looking at uh, all the one loop amplitudes of our model, we can deduce what is the generalized oriented for projection. And it is not trivial, it is the omega prime usual times some non supersymmetric generator involving this delta W9, which is what we call the winding shift, but details are not very important. The thing is that with this oriented for projection, and the classical periodicity on the circle, we would not understand why there are at the same time orientifold planes and entire orientifold planes. So the supersymmetric torus amplitude cannot be okay. And a way to see what this torus should be uh, goes as follows. So the starting supersymmetric uh, point, we saw that it was uh, a model with uh, by where we keep a quantized value for the anti-symmetric tensor P. Actually, there is an equivalent realization of this, uh, which amounts to consider a freely acting orbifold, which has this form. So this is again a, a winding shift and this is the usual freely acting orbifold. And then if you do this orbifold and you apply a rescaling, this gives you a similar a construction, which is identical to to the one where with the quantized baby. So now with this, with this construction, with the free lighting orbifold, it is very easy to, to build an, a non supersymmetric torus amplitude in the shared Schwartz spirit, spirit just by coupling this generator G to the minus one to the F. So this will produce a soft breaking uh, a la shared Schwartz in the torus amplitude. And now with this, we understand why we have at the same time, orientifold planes and anti orientifold planes, because this will change the periodicity along the circle uh, in direction nine, uh, which will involve the minus one to the F. And when combined with this one, it will cancel to give orientifold planes. And the periodicity along X, X8 times this, uh, in this case, we will keep a minus one to the F factor coming from there and give uh, an orientifold plane, which is of opposite uh, type of the previous one. So with this soft breaking in the clustering sector, we understand why there are orientifold planes and anti orientifold planes. So this justifies that the torus cannot be the supersymmetric one. Actually, there is a soft breaking. So because there is a soft breaking in the torus, uh, supersymmetry is recovered in two limits in this case at small R8 limit or big R9. But when we look at these limits, it turns out that the effective field theory description uh, breaks down. When at small R8, it turns out that the open sector also becomes supersymmetric, but then we end up with a massless spectrum from which we cannot give an interpretation from an ID point of view. So this implies that the limit should break down. And in the big R9 limit, this would seem like a true brain supersymmetry breaking model in the sense that in this limit, the torus and thus the closed string sector would become supersymmetric. And on the other end, the open string sector would not. But in this case, there is a collapse of a Kaluzak line towers, which changes the tadpole conditions, which is no more satisfied. So again, this limit is uh, inconsistent. Actually, the fact that these two limits are inconsistent could be expected, should be expected, because it is in agreement with the gravity no mass conjecture, conjecture saying that you cannot send uh, the mass of the gravity no to zero while having supersymmetry break. Okay, so this was the first part of my talk. Now let's move on to the, the second subject where we will want to compute masses acquired at one loop by moduli in a type one model. Okay, so the setup in which we will work is the following. It is the so-called gimon polchiski model where there is a non-freely acting Z2 acting on a T4. And we further compactify that to four, down to four dimension on a T2. 
and we implement a Schwartz mechanism along some direction X5, which is inside this T2, uh, so that the, the Z2 does not act on the same torus where there is the Schwartz mechanism. And this produces an N equals two, spontaneously broken to N equals zero model. In this setup, there are fixed points of omega and of omega times G. So this produces both a space-time feeding on I minus plane and 16 of five minus plane. To cancel the Raman platforms, this necessitates the introduction of D9 brains and D5 brains, 32 of each. Okay, in this model, when you put the brains on top of the orientifold planes, this gives unitary gauge groups so that naively, and we will understand later why I say naively, the maximum gauge group would be U16 times U16. Okay, so now that the setup is settled, what we want to do in the end is to evaluate the masses of all the moduli of the model uh, that they require when we take one loop effect into account. So let's begin by giving a list of all the moduli present in the model and briefly say the method that we used and we will give a bit more details in the following. So first, there are the positions of the D5 brains along the T4, also the Wilson lines on the D5 brains along the T2, and the Wilson lines on the D9 brains along the whole internal space. Altogether, these moduli are those of the Neumann domain and directly directed sector of the theorem. To evaluate the, the one loop masses, we can compute the effective potential and just tailor expand it to second order and just read the mass. And we'll see what, that we can also use a clever method which requires no computations and only the knowledge of the massless spectrum, but we will see that in very soon. Then there are the moduli of the untwisted cluster sector for the NS and S1, so typically the metric. We will again rely on the computation of the, the effective potential. And for the Raman Raman one, we will invoke a duality between heterotic and type one strings. Then there are also scalars in the clustering sector, but that are twisted. And to see what happens to them, we will have to invoke a generalized Green Schwartz mechanism, which is occurring in the model. And finally, there are the, the nastiest one of the, of the project, the scalars that are in the Neumann directed sector of the theory. And to evaluate their mass at one loop, we will compute their two point functions. Okay, so the three first bullets here in, uh, in blue, which are the moduli in the Neumann domain and directed direct -led sector of the theory, they can all be given geometric interpretation in the property dual theory. So of course the position of the D5 brain in the T4 have already a geometric interpretation and we can convert the Wilson lines on the D5, on the D brains into positions of D3 brains if we T-dualize the T2 or if we T-dualize the whole internal space in, for the D9 brain sector. So with that in mind, it is a bit abusive, but we can represent a brain configuration uh, by drawing on the same picture, D3 brains to dual to D9 brains or D3 brains to dual to D5 brain. So this is a bit abusive, but if we know what we are doing, this is not a problem at all. This means that we can interchangeably talk about brain position or Wilson lines, because we always keep in mind that we are referring to the proper T dual theory. So in these drawings, there are the Horizontally, you have the two directions of the T2 with the Schach Schwartz implementing in this direction. And this formally depicts the, the T4 or the T dual T4. It is also useful to introduce a labeling for the old 64 fixed point of the internal space to specify then brain configuration. So for this, we use when index i, which goes from 1 to 16 to label the fixed point of the T4 and an index I prime, which goes from one to four, which labels the four fixed point of the T2. Okay, so I say that for the Neumann-Neumann and directly directed scalars, we wanted to compute the effective potential. So we can do this. We do this uh, assuming a background where the brains are put on top of the oriented planes, and we can 
simply Taylor expand the uh, one new potential we compute and read the masses and then conclude uh, under which condition the brain configuration introduces instabilities for these scalars or not. The fact that we put brains on top of the orientifold planes has the following consequence. There is no linear term, so no tadpole. And it turns out that the constant term, so the, the magnitude of the potential is given by the breaking scale to the power of four. Okay, actually we can deduce the masses of this moduli without uh, complicated computations by using a generic formula, which is valid in metallic strings, and which goes as follows. Suppose you have a gauge group, which is a product of some gauge factor, you consider all widths and lines. Then in a regime where the radius used to implement the Schach-Schwarz mechanism is sufficiently large, the one loop potential takes the following uh, suggestive form. First, there is uh, the constant term, which does not depend on the Wilson line, which is proportional to m to the four, and the proportionality coefficient is given by this in blue, nf minus nb, where these numbers count the number of degrees of freedom, uh, of massless degrees of freedom, fermionic for nf and bosonic for nb. Okay, then there is no linear term and the quadratic term, no matter the details here, we see that they are multiplied by this coefficients, which is so TRB minus TRF, these T's are the Dinkin indices of the representations under which the massless bosons and fermions transform. So what this means actually is that to evaluate the masses acquired at one loop by the Wilson lines, by the moduli, you just need to know the representation under which your massless states transform. And then you compute algebraically this difference and you can conclude if this mass is positive or negative. A feature of this formula is the following. So typically when you implement a Schwarz mechanism, you give a mass to all the fermions. So you have a big excess of bosons and you have a very negative potential. So if you want to uplift it, you need to find ways to increase the number of massless fermions. But on the same time, we see that, so the magnitude of the potential is given by fermion minus bosons, but on the other hand, the stability of the Wilson lines is given by the contrary, bosons minus fermion. So the, the objective to, to uplift the potential is in contradiction with the objective to keep uh, to not introduce instability. So we expect it to be, to be hard to find potential that are uplifted uh, to zero, for example, up to exponential, exponentially suppressed terms, while uh, maintaining stability of all with some lines. Okay, let's continue. We say that there are the scalars in the untwisted cross sector. So for the NSNS one, the metric, because there is no B. Uh, the computation of the one-loop potential reveals that it only depends on the Scherk-Schwarz radius, so the breaking scale, meaning that there is a runaway unless there is this both Fermi degeneracy at the massless level, like we saw on the previous formula. And then for the Raman-Raman scalars, the CIG, to, to settle on their stability or not, we can invoke a duality between type one and heterotic string. The C uh, is mapped to B. And we know from the heterotic side that the, the only dependence, the dependence of the one-loop potential in, to this, in this B comes from states associated to enhancements in the loop, which run, when, when they run in the loop, and we know that these states have non-trivial winding numbers. So on the type one side, they are mapped to non perturbative states, E1 brains. So we conclude that these are flat directions and do not introduce any instability. And then, because the introduction of the Z2 action introduces twisted state, but these twisted states on the heteroic side do not produce any enhancements, we conclude that the, the fact that the CIJs are flat direction is still correct. Okay, then there are the scalars in the closed sector, but which are twisted. 
to say something about them, we need to invoke a green Schwartz mechanism, which occurs in the model. So you know that for anomaly constellation, you need to add three level couplings between four forms and uh, gauge fields. When you do that, this introduces a mass matrix for these gauge fields that you can diagonalize. So when you do that, actually, what we what you realize when you compactify then uh, on the T two is that the component along the T two, which are the Wilson lines that whose mass we evaluated before with the computation of the one loop potential here, actually this naive stability conditions drawn from these computations is improved by the presence of this three level mass matrix. So for each non-zero non -zero eigenvalue of this three level mass matrix, we can safely remove these uh, moduli from the uh, one loop analysis because we know that they already have acquired a, three level, a big three level mass. Okay, what this has to do with the twisted closed, closed cycle scanners, well, by supersymmetry, the number of non-zero eigenvalues of this three-level mass matrix is equal to the number of twisted scanners that will also acquire mass. And it turns out that in this setup, uh, at least two and a maximum of 16, uh, well, this mass matrix has at least two and a maximum of six, 16 non-zero eigenvalues. And this depends on the number of unitary gauge factors that are present in six dimensions. So here we understand what I, when I say that the U16 to U16 was a bit naive is that at, because at least two U1s get a mass so that actually the biggest gauge group you can obtain in this model is S, SU16 times SU16. And if you want to, if you want the twisted scalars to be, if you want to be sure that they are stable because they acquire a three level mass, there are 16 of them, so you need to have 16 unitary factor in six dimension so that you, you are sure that they will not introduce any instability. Okay, and finally, there are some moduli in the normal Dirichlet sector of the theory. So with our pictorial representation, they correspond to string, strings that are stretched between stacks of D3 brains, T dual to D9 brains, and D3 brains, T dual to D5 brains. And to evaluate their mass, it was not an easy task we have computed the two-point function of the, these states at one loop. So there are several topology for the diagrams. This diagram has the topology of an annulus, and this is the, the double cover torus of this diagram. On the annulus, there is a free boundary here, gamma, which refers either to the, to the D9 brains or to the D5 brains. And there is also a diagram which has the shape of a Mobius strip. So in the end, what we want to compute, we want to sum over all these topologies, all the Chan pattern factors, alpha zero, beta zero. And we want to evaluate correlators involving two vertex operators for these uh, Neumann Dirichlet scanners. So this is not easy because, because these vertex operators, they contain these sigma, sigma three, sigma four, which are what we call boundary changing operators. So these boundary changing operators are, uh, we understand that they should be here because it's them that they manage the change of boundary conditions from Neumann to Dirichlet or the contrary on the world sheet. So when we evaluate our amplitude, we go the detail, but it splits between an external amplitude and an internal amplitude. And this internal amplitude is what we are interested in to extract the mass of the states at one loop. And it involves correlator, correlators of these boundary changing operators or these tau that are excited version of these operators. And these correlation functions actually are very uh, complicated to evaluate at one loop. Fortunately, there is a way to do that uh, by using a correspondence between these boundary changing operators and what we call twist fields, which are, which are fields that create states in the twisted sector of the Hilbert space of closed string or before theories. So we could use all this one loop twist field technology that has been uh, developed uh, some decades ago to apply 
the results into the computation of correlators of boundary changing operators, and then be able to compute the two point function of these scanners and finally extract the mass. But this was not an easy task at all. Okay, so after we have done all that, well, it means that we have all the masses acquired at one root by all the moduli present in the model. So that with these results, we are able to say, given a brain configuration, if instabilities are introduced or if it is okay. <clears throat> in a easier model with n equals four supersymmetry broken to n equals zero, uh, some authors uh, performed a, a similar study and what they wanted to find is models where they could uplift the one loop potential to zero up to exponentially suppressed terms while maintaining stability. And what they found is that they could not do that actually. They could not do that and end up with a model with a, no, a non-trivial gauge root. So motivated by the same uh, objective, we want to, to see if we can find stable models uh, without with an exponentially suppressed uh, potential. But if you remember this uh, big formula with the competition between the magnitude of the potential and the stability, this is expected to be R because when we uplift the potential, then we uh, risk to destabilize the modular. So to, to look for such models, we applied, we, we used numerical simulations <clears throat> with an algorithm that goes as follows. So first, we looped over all the brain distributions along the T4. This is where the picture, the geometric pictures is, is, is nice to, to handle this. Then we compute and diagonalize the, the mass matrix, which is involved in the green Schwartz mechanism. Then we distribute the brains along the T2. And we do that uh, while not introducing its abilities for the Wilson lines along the T4. So this can be done directly we don't have to to consider all brain distributions and then check that we do not introduce tachyons for these uh, wilson lines actually we can directly distribute the brain so that it is not the case so this is this is a, a bit this requires less computations then uh, well the brains are all distributed so we can compute the massless spectrum and we can restrict to configuration where the number of massless fermions is equal to the number of massless bosons, so that the potential will be exponentially suppressed. And then as a last step, we can first compute the naive masses for the Wilson lines along the T2, but then we saw that there is this green Schwartz mechanism which improves the, this naive analysis. So then we apply the green Schwartz mechanism, meaning we diagonalize to go into the basis um, which they analyze the, the, the mass matrix, we reject, we, we remove from the analysis all the moduli that get a three level mass. We end up with a smaller matrix that we diagonalize again, and we reject if we find a negative eigenvalues. And it turns out that, well, there are hundreds of billions of possibilities of configuration, brain configuration, and it turns out that only three models in the end pass uh, on these filters. So they are drawn here, but it is not uh, very important just to see that they correspond to gauge groups that are non-trivial. So this is an improvement compared to the easier case with n equals four, where they could not find exponentially suppressed potential with non-trivial gauge group. Introducing this uh, Z2 and, and giving an n equals two model uh, is a way to improve this result. Okay, so now we can go, we can move on to the last part of this talk where we will work in a heterotic string framework and we want to, to study the back reaction of the one loop potential on the cosmology. So what we want to do more particularly is the following. We want to start from a, what we call a no scale model, which is a model with uh, spontaneous breaking of supersymmetry in flat space and where the breaking scale is a flat direction of the classical potential. Then as we said, there will be a one loop potential. So this will destroy the no scale structure. 
unless, as we saw with these generic formulas, unless there is a both Fermi degeneracy at the massless level. So yeah, we want to study the back reaction of the one loop potential and the cosmology, and more particularly, what we want to do is the, the question we ask is, can we still find free Lorentz or metzard lobet walker solutions that reproduce asymptotically the no-scale evolution? So the question we ask is, we will add the one loop potential, we will study the cosmology, and we will we want to see if we can asymptotically reach uh, an evolution, which is as if the one loop potential was not here. So we want to see under which condition the one loop potential does not spoil asymptotically the classical conclusions. And we did that first in a toy model with a very restricted number of fields to get an idea of what's going on. And then we added some Wilson lines to see how this changes the conclusions. Okay, so I will be quite quick about that. Again, in a regime where the where the radius used to implement the Schachtroth mechanism is moderate, sufficiently large, the one loop potential takes this easy formula that we already saw. So first, we considered only a restricted number of fields, the scale factor A involved in the FRLW metric, dilate and find the radius R used to break supersymmetry. The first thing to do is to perform a, a redefinition of fields. We define phi and phi bot such that the, the, the breaking scale in Einstein frame, uh, which originally depends on the dilaton and on the radius, now only depends on this capital phi and is independent of this uh, phi bot. The action is the following. We make an ansatz of a FRLW metric. We suppose the field to depend only on the time coordinate. We derive the equations of motion. So there are two Einstein equations and the equations of motions of phi and phi bot. Uh, okay, what we find is that the behavior depends on the ratio of two constants, which are integration constants arising in the, when we integrate once the equation of motions of phi bot and phi. What we find is the, the following, when the ratio of this constant is higher than some critical value, which is only possible when the one loop potential is negative, so when there are more bosons than fermions at the massless level, <coughs> um, we find the following evolution. So this shows the, the evolution of the scale factor A with respect to tau, which is a redefined time variable. What we find in this case is that the universe grows, which is a maximum size, and then collapse. So in this case, we cannot find ever expanding solution. Okay, now the dynamics is more involved when the ratio of this constant is lower than the critical value. In this case, there are two particular values for the, the parameter tau, tau plus and tau minus, which defines three regions. Uh, for tau lower than the tau minus or higher than the tau plus, this, is, this corresponds to a negative potential, while when tau is between these two particular values, this corresponds to a positive potential. And actually, the particular trajectory is where tau is constant equals to tau plus or tau minus. So in this case, tau loses it, its interpretation as a time variable, and we need to go back to the real time t. This corresponds to the super scale case, Supernova no scale means that when there is the both Fermi degeneracy at the massless level. So in this case, what, what is the cosmology? Actually, it describes a big bang, which is followed by a never expanding era. So this shows you the evolution of the scale factor in the three, three branches with the two particular values, tau minus and tau plus. And what's important to note is that the trajectories can asymptotically reach an evolution which is identical to the constant tau plus or tau minus, which corresponds to the case where nf equals nb. So this means that in this regime, there is a one loop potential, but actually it does not play any role and it is subdominant in the evolution, which matches the one uh, we find when there is no potential. So we dubbed such regimes quantum no-scale regimes, meaning that the quantum correction does not spoil the classical no-scale evolution. 
Okay, then we ask the question, what if we uh, consider a more involved um, setup? What if we turn on some Wilson lines? How does this change the dynamic? What we demonstrated is that uh, we can always find such quantum scale regimes, but, but there is not always uh, a global attractor to this, uh, to this solution. So to study the existence or not of global attractors, we perform numerical simulations and we find two cases. Uh, either the sign of the one potential is not definite while the Wilson lines vary and you can change signs, or it keeps uh, definite positive uh, values regardless of the value of the Wilson lines. In the first case, what we find is that uh, we cannot be attracted to solutions with ever expanding uh, cosmology. The universe always collapses unless we sit in, the, in a tiny region of parameter space in the initial conditions, which ensure that we reach the quantum scale regime that we demonstrated to exist, but there is no global attractor in this case. But in the second case, uh, we find such a global attractor and the trajectory is always attracted to the quantum scale regime. All right, time to conclude, yes. So I described uh, three different lines of research that I have explored during my PhD. The first one was the description of a new supersymmetry breaking mechanism. We saw that we, the objective was, was to, to describe a mechanism which share properties with brain supersymmetry breaking while avoiding the usual neve schwartz neve schwartz tadpoles. Then a follow-up of this work would be to, to add some orbifold in the game to see how this Changing the conclusion, if in, maybe it introduces uh, interesting ingredients. Then in another directions, we studied the stability of moduli at one loop by computing uh, their masses acquired at one loop. We worked in a setup where there were a lot of different kinds of moduli that required different techniques to evaluate their masses. We saw that it is generally hard to uplift the one loop potential while while avoiding instabilities. And of course, in the few models that we found, uh, they are still have uh, flat directions. So of course we don't find vacua and there is still the need to stabilize the breaking scale and the dilator. Finally, in the third lines of research, we wanted to study the influence of the potential direction and what loop on the cosmology of the models. Uh, for this, we worked in iteratic strings. We asked the question of the stability at one loop of the no scale structure from a cosmological point of view. And what we find is that what we dubbed quantum no scale regimes, where the one loop potential is dominated, they always exist, but they are highly favored when the one loop potential is positive, as we saw with the global attractor mechanism. And that's all for me. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for the nice talk, just in time. So let me ask to the audience if there is any question. Meanwhile, I can ask you something. So, so you, you constructed several models that uh, you try to be well, you try to avoid uh, instabilities, no? You say that they are stable, but I guess you always have in mind perturbative instabilities, right? So that you don't want to have any tachyon so that mm -hmm. the brains stay fixed. But have you thought about non-perturbative instabilities? Because we would then expect to have these non-supersymmetric models to be completely stable, right? Mm, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. We, we restricted to a perturbative analysis, so we did not consider this, this non-perturbative one. So in these cases with the different O-planes, the anti-O-planes and mm -hmm. planes, what would be the non-perturbative decay channel? Well, um, I must admit I don't really know. Mm 
Okay, I was wondering just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I think that <clears throat> I, I don't know for sure in these examples, but I, I my picture is that they would be analogous to this uh, Horaba Fabinger uh, non perturbative instability, where I mean, this is an M theory, but you have two boundaries, which are the analogs of two orientifold planes, and one of them has flipped supersymmetry. So it preserves the other Susie. So it's like the anti orientifold plane in this case. And then there is a, there are you, you can you can develop some bubbles which are holes that go from one boundary to the other. Um, I would expect something similar to that would happen in this case. I I think that. And in that, that fact, Angel, in that case, the point is that you constructed putting some anti periodic boundary conditions uh, in the M theory circle. So you have bubbles mm -hmm. of nothing and this type of things, yes. right? Is the, the same the, type of bubble of nothing you are thinking of? Well, th this is also a question for Tibo. In, in these cases with orientifolds and anti orientifolds, mm -hmm. if you do a T duality and combine the, both of them into one orientifold, probably you go to this kind of Sherzoar pictures where there are some anti periodic fermions or something like that. Is that right? Or um, Can you repeat your, your question? Yes. It, for instance, if you take this model and you do T duality mm -hmm. in the vertical direction so that the orientifolds and anti orientifolds are combined together, this okay. corresponds to an orientifold compactified on the circle with probably SUSI breaking uh, boundary conditions for the fermions. Right? Is, that, mm -hmm. is that right? Uh, yeah, I see what you mean. Mm. Uh, yeah, can you relate this always to some circle bars, like some anti-periodic boundary condition? It should be because you have, uh, in the individual picture, you have an unoriented form which is wrapped on a circle, but it's an object that breaks SUSI. So you have to break SUSI in some way yeah. with a single object. So and lo locally, it's just an oriented fold plane. So locally, you preserve SUSI, but globally, once you go on the circle, you break it. So it, it looks to me that uh, it has to be yeah, something like that. You, you have antiperiodic fermions, something like that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not crystal clear to me, but yeah, yeah, you, you're right that it's... Uh, Sounds like that. I, I don't know for sure, but I'm just guessing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I remember from the... Yeah, maybe with the anti-07, I can imagine that this is what happens. But for example, if it's only 07 plus, I remember I was once with Iñaki, like trying to to construct a bubble of nothing there and trying to see if one could also understand that there are some hidden like, anti-periodic boundary conditions. But we didn't manage to show this. So I'm not sure, yeah, how general it is or like this, whenever we break it globally, you know, as you said, uh, whether it can always be identified with some sort of sex bars breaking. But yeah, it would be interesting to understand it. Yeah, we'll have a look at that. More questions? Maybe just another question. <clears throat> so in the very old times, there was this idea that uh, perhaps one could cook up models which are non-supersymmetric, but they are they have a, a zero cosmological constant to all orders in perturbation theory. And people were competing. I mean, at one loop, it was more, it was more or less easy. And then at two loops, they were working out there was a paper by Cacho and Silverstein and some other people tried with Orientifolds. So I don't know what was the outcome of that story and whether one can use your ideas to, I don't know, I don't know, bring some hope to that project, which I think it was at the end at the time, people got discouraged. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. What's your opinion on this? Well, uh, in, our setup, in our setup, like I said, in a similar construction uh, long ago, uh, people thought that the, the clustering sector was really supersymmetric, but we, we showed that this cannot be the case. Mm -hmm. If it was the case, then yes, we could, well, at least at one loop, we could uh, find a zero cosmological constant, but the fact that there is actually this soft break breaking in the, in the torus mm -hmm. prevented us from, from doing that because the contributions are scale differently and we could not cancel that. But at the beginning, when, where, when we did not really realize that and the, the clustering sector could not be supersymmetric, we had some hope, but then we were <laughs> disappointed. Mm -hmm. Thanks.
Yeah, following this, so can you identify like some necessary conditions or sufficient even to guarantee that at least the one loop cosmological constant vanishes? I mean, because I know there is also all this revival of misaligned supersymmetry and so on, uh, which is also present, no? in, might be present in this type of models. I don't know. Yeah, this I is don't... present in the Sugimoto model, so. Yeah, I don't, I don't know much about this, this misaligned thing. Uh, so, so yeah, I don't, don't really know. Okay. Well, if there are no further questions that I don't see any, let's thank Thibaut again for the nice talk. Thank you. Um, see you at the FT. Yeah, thank you very much to all of you. Thanks a lot.